Hello and thank you very much for coming along. Once again this evening we're going to be looking at a rather macro problem in part because of all of the extraordinary events we've had in the last few weeks with major climate events and human interactions with the ecosystem that we hadn't really even thought about <clears throat> two weeks ago. But now we want to look particularly at the ways in which climate change is intruding upon our capacity to survive as human beings, <clears throat> not just because of se severe weather events, which we're going to be facing on an increasingly, increasingly severe and increasingly frequent basis, but asking ourselves <clears throat> what's going to happen as a result of the changed hydrological cycle. In particular, its interaction with the pedological cycle, the whole cycle of earth formation, soil formation, and soil sustainability. This is something we don't spend a lot of time on in academic circles, especially in Ivy League schools. In fact, there isn't a central agricultural school in any of the Ivy League schools except for Cornell. Only Cornell has a major component to agricultural ecology. All the other Ivies think that agriculture is a matter of agribusiness or something like that, <laughs> um, <clears throat> that it has nothing to do with what they do in higher education. Well, that's what we're going to uh, be able to <coughs> look at a little bit more intelligent here, intelligently, because the tragedy is that we treat soil like dirt. Yet we don't realize that topsoil and climate change <coughs> have been at the center of the collapse of civilizations again and again and again in human history. It's the kind of constant drumbeat in human history overshoot and collapse because of the way topsoil and climate interaction uh, interact over time. Now, Al Gore has been <clears throat> very good at underscoring the precarious nature of the atmosphere and the changes occurring to it. He actually got a, uh, a series of things together in a slideshow, which you may have seen, became a movie, and he got a Nobel Peace Prize for this. In fact, I think it's the only Nobel Peace Prize ever given for a slideshow. It's an important slideshow. You should definitely see it if you haven't. Uh, this is the kind of thing that can change minds and change behavior if taken seriously. Basically, he pointed out, and other scientists that he bases his material on pointed out, that a very slight change in the gaseous composition of the atmosphere can change the heat budget of the entire planet because of how those gases can trap heat at the Earth's surface rather than letting it re-radiate out to space. This is not uh, complicated physics. It's now well understood, has been for hundreds of years now, um, and he gave some great publicity to it. But <clears throat> we ought to take a look at some other aspects of the system. Our atmosphere is in fact very thin considered to the scale of the globe as a whole and certainly to the scale of the sun and the, the globe as a system. He became famous for pointing out that it's as thin as a coat of shellac on a classroom globe. <laughs> he held up a globe at one point and said the atmosphere is real proportional size compared to the globe he was holding up, one of these classroom globes that you learn about in elementary school. Uh, <clears throat> the atmosphere is about as thick as the layer of shellac on top of this classroom globe. And it's a good approximation to show that, in fact, the atmosphere is very, very thin. And yet it's just a slight change in the ga gaseous proportions of CO2 to the other gases and other heat trapping gases like methane to the nitrogen which is the dominant gas in the atmosphere and the oxygen. Slight change in that proportion will change the whole heat budget of the system. Well, he didn't go on to point out that there's something even thinner 
and even more precarious, that will determine our survival as well. And that is the topsoil. The topsoil on the surface of the earth is far thinner than the atmosphere above it. The atmosphere may be represented by <coughs> the layer of shellac on a classroom globe, but the topsoil is far, far thinner. The atmosphere can be measured in miles, <laughs> like six or seven miles up, 35,000, 40,000, 55, 60,000 feet different layers of the atmosphere. But the topsoil is far thinner, which is measured only in a few inches in some places, or perhaps a few feet, if you're lucky. Now you can actually see this from a distance. We can view it from an airplane. Just think how thin that layer of green is on top of this rock. It's staggering when you think of it, especially when you look around and realize that most of the earth is rock. Only a very thin blanket occurs in some spaces upon which plants can grow. It's very staggering, and geologists have summarized it for us very clearly. Let's listen. Most of the planet is not living. It's mineral. It's never known life. It's just this rock. And yet soil starts forming on it and creates this very thin layer where life is possible. Soil is this very thin layer, very, very thin layer. Most of the planet is rock. There's no life on it at all. But there's this very thin layer which starts formulating itself in conjunction with the substrate rock and the biological activity of countless millions of different kinds of species that live at the Earth's surface and work on the rock to create, over eons of time, hundreds of millions of years, create a thin layer of topsoil which allows them to reproduce as organisms. It's a staggering <coughs> realization. <coughs> Far thinner than the atmosphere, <coughs> which is measured in miles, right, or thousands of feet. There is the topsoil, which is only a few inches, or perhaps a few feet deep, if you're lucky, and we can see this from above. Most of the planet is not living. There is only a very thin layer where life is possible. When sunlight hits the rock, guess what? <laughs> There's no biological activity there. It's when sunlight hits the topsoil that you get the possibility of the capture of solar energy in biomass in the soil. Now we've got to keep an eye on this, especially in reference to climate change, because we're far more precarious than we thought in just having the atmosphere change. We've got to think about our role in permaculture, moving agriculture to a permanent feature, because we as humans don't photosynthesize. If you think you do, go ahead and stand outside in the sun for a while. See how much food you can produce. It's simple. Humans don't produce food. Plants produce food. And guess what? Plants need soil in order to produce food. So you can say very clearly that our only significant role in ecological terms, in an ecosystem, is to ask the question, are we producing topsoil to enable plants to produce food? Because if we're not, we're on the wrong side of photosynthesis. This is why permaculture, being promoted by John Gerber and others out at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, they actually give a degree now in permaculture, permanent agriculture. And their point is quite clear. Soil is the, the key to permanent 
truly sustainable agriculture. Without it, you don't have sustainable agriculture. You have unsustainable agriculture and that's suicidal. So he started to emphasize this in all levels of teaching, right down to the public demonstrations among elementary school students. Permanent agriculture is permanent plus culture is permaculture and that's permanent agriculture. Why is it so controversial? Well, it's not actually among scientists because consider our basic paradox. We live on the third rock from the sun and yet most of the planet is not living. Let's repeat it. Most of the planet is not living. It's mineral, it's never known life, it's just this rock. And yet soil starts forming on it and creates this very thin layer where life is possible. Soil is the interface between biology and geology. It's sort of the living skin of the earth. of years it is. This hasn't been shaped by life yet. Many of the elements have been washed out of the soil because it's so wet here. We make about 200 to 300 yards of our own compost every year. But we don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. Okay. Hope you got that. She's a farmer, but she says it quite clearly. We don't grow plants. We grow soil. Soil grows plants. Now, if a farmer understands that, we better start understanding that as a human community. Humans don't grow food. Plants grow food. Plants need soil. Soil can take tens of thousands of years to form. The soil just goes down and down and down and down and down. Deep, rich. Now, it didn't start off like that. You cannot have good flavor without that kind of uh, attention to detail and, and knowledge of the biology. If we have declared a war against the soil itself, then we are literally committing a species level suicide. And the only thing that I can see that really looks promising is to get back to the fundamentals of the soil. The soil returns to what it was like when it was first broken out. So alive and so vital. Well, I heard you see it. Symphony of the Soil. How fantastic scientific documentary on the first four inches. First four inches that cover parts of the earth upon which we all depend for our food supply. This has been discussed at great length by people who've looked at the film. Soil is truly a miraculous substance. It is connected to all life on our planet and is teeming with life all on its own. Scientists have said one million creatures exist in a tablespoon of topsoil and that there are more living organisms beneath the surface of the soil than above. It's pretty amazing. To help us dig into and appreciate the mysteries of soil, we are honest, honored to host conservation agronomist Tom Aiken, microbial ecologist Dr. Sarita Fry, and farmer Jim Ward for our screening of the film, Symphony of the Soil. Well, you can get access to these things through transition studies, because it's precisely that transition we need to make at this point. 
we've got to start talking to soil agronomists and to farmers and to economists and figure out what the heck's going on. Biointensive agriculture is the answer. I'm in my 40th year of doing this and what we've been doing is empowering people, families and communities everywhere to grow all their own food locally. My job is to make this understanding and this system available and to get it in the hands of people so they don't become extinct. Each one of us are wonderful. We just need to have the tools in our hands. My mentor, Alan Chadwick, was in the Navy in the Second World War. He experienced a lot of death and destruction. After the war, he met Fry von Malka, and they decided that they wanted to end war. And they thought they could do it by gardening. And they believed that as people breathed life into the soil, they would breathe life into themselves. You can get wonderful food, and you don't need the poisons. Why not try life? Give life a chance. In 100 square feet, one person can learn in like 10 to 15 minutes a day on the average how to grow every crop they'll ever need to know how to grow. And a lot of people have access to that. So we really need farming literacy. We need farming literacy especially among those who think they're going to Ivy schools and transcending the biological processes. As he puts it, we need to stop growing crops and start growing soil. John Jevons, look him up. Look him up on Transition Studies. He's a Yale graduate who has devoted his life to protecting and promoting the development of topsoil. Well, but it's about the past, it's quite clear we've been ignoring the soils as a human species, and we can learn that if we do a half decent reading of past civilizations. Did they understand the impact they were having? Not a chance. This was pointed out to the Senate quite a while ago, back in 1988, it's almost <clears throat> 30 years ago at this point, and um, CNN recorded it, actually. Dr. Weisko. Hmm. I'm trained as an anthropologist. I mean, doctor, you're going to have to pull that microphone quite a bit closer. I'm this sorry? The system requires uh, microphones that are very close to you. Enough. I'm trained as an anthropologist, and I was asked to uh, comment on the middle range uh, between years and decades and the last uh, two million years in some sense. Um, it's not entirely true that we're facing unprecedented circumstances. Uh, while Vice President Bush recently, in respecting the uh, beach pollution this past summer, indicated that 1988 was the year that the environment began to talk back, in reality the environment has been talking back to man for centuries, indeed millennia. What is striking in retrospect is our seeming inability or our stubborn refusal as a culture and perhaps even as a species to hear what it has been saying. The message we should have heard is simple. All civilizations depend ultimately on the ecological viability of their primary productivity, that is, their agricultural base and their forest regeneration. Those cultures whose ecosystems function so as to destroy topsoil squander fossil water, or deplete plant genetic resources, are destined over time to experience either permanent dependence on other cultures or certain and sudden ecological decline on their own. The environmental archaeology of ancient civilizations makes this dramatically apparent. Agricultural societies of the ancient Near East frequently reached population densities that exceeded the capacity of their land to produce food on a sustainable basis. Problems of overgrazing, watershed deforestation, soil erosion, siltation, water logging, soil salinization, and crop blight emerged as the permanent hallmark of these ancient civilizations. The dynamic involved in the rise and fall of ancient societies 
contained an irreducible ecological component. Well, <clears throat> the testimony went on to illustrate case after case, was written up in articles called The Ecological Lessons of the Past uh, in 1989, and then came out as a book in terms of environmental decline and public policy, looking at pattern, trend, and prospect. And the prospect is uh, not encouraging, because we could stabilize, but it looks like overshoot and collapse, not the transition to sustainability, but the business as usual, no change in beliefs, expand, grow, 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 and then collapse, is the drumbeat of human history. This has been pointed out again and again by scholars looking at the collapse of complex societies. Ancient impact of humans on the environment is pretty staggering, having to do with the soil in particular. Edward Himes pointed to it years ago. Um, <clears throat> Vernon Carter and Tom Dale put out a piece on top soil and civilization back in the 50s. And when you look at the archaeological evidence, the sites, and you look at the valleys, the estuaries into which the topsoil was eroded, you can see that soils in archaeology have laid forward a pretty depressing and continuous story of human occupation and soil destruction. This has been true in one hydrological uh, or hydraulic civilization after another, like ancient Egypt, but it's been true for the Romans and the Greeks, and we're all inheritors in the sense of devastation of the circum-Mediterranean, as Attenborough pointed out in a book. If you look at soils, climate, and society, the story is not encouraging. There have been ecological consequences of human niche construction, that is to say manipulating the environment for our own advantage, and the consequences have been not sustainability, but overshoot and collapse on a regular basis. This has been dramatically apparent in times of abrupt climate change. Take a look. This happened to ancient Egypt. The same way that Kansas City served as the hub which collected grain from the great grain belt of the United States, so Leilan served as a great collection point for northern Mesopotamian agricultural production. Archaeologists believe they have evidence that the sudden collapse of the kingdom of ancient Egypt was due to a catastrophic drought. During the same period, another ancient empire was also in turmoil. The Akkadian Empire extended far across Mesopotamia, now part of Iraq and Syria. The agricultural capital was Leilan. The ancient city was surrounded by fertile tracts of land and had a population of 30,000, according to Yale University archaeologist, Dr. Harvey Weiss. When I first went to Leilan, I was terribly impressed by its physical size. Its physical size was enormous, but it collapsed in a matter of decades. And it's staggering, the work that Professor Weiss has done and now called us to look at, particularly looking at the topsoils and what happens to them in times of abrupt climate change. This is what he's holding a conference on next month, October, about the collapse of civilizations and, as he calls it, collapse? What collapse? Societal adaptations to abrupt climate change before global warming. <clears throat> this is staggering. He's the convener, organizer of the conference, but he's looking at the ways in which changes in <clears throat> rainfall patterns have caused collapses in the past. And they've done so more recently, not so much because of droughts, but because of floods. China's flood is particularly worrisome in this respect, and we're starting to calculate the cost of this. The problem is that we're basically treating soil like dirt. And we're not realizing how precarious our existence is because of this. If we're going to do climate damage assessment, we've got to do the assessment about the loss of topsoils in these massive hurricanes that have taken off things from the Caribbean islands, 
from Texas, from Florida, from all arable land. Thank you.